Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz pianist Jeremy Siskind. He talks about his 2020 CD and book project called Perpetual Motion, Etudes for Piano. It was a well-funded Kickstarter campaign, and this is a project written to help all performers and listeners to cultivate concentration and flow and to quiet the voices inside their heads. Because of the precision and coordination they require, these pieces raise the stakes of concentration and flow. He wants to help musicians everywhere win the mental game of music, so please get to know Jeremy and this project and dig this interview, my friends. Jeremy, thank you for taking a minute out. Thank you for sending the book. Thank you for sending the CD. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. So I appreciate it. Great. And the one thing I did notice today when I was kind of looking into it a little bit more is that this, is, this was a Kickstarter campaign. Yes. It was fully funded. You know, that's the thing I love about Kickstarter and these kind of crowdfunding things. It's like you already got buy-in before you even do it. And then it probably just has to sweeten the deal when it comes to fruition. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's a little bit less pressure and it gets the feeling that people are kind of on your team that everybody's on your side um and then they're stakeholders you know in the in creating these things and promoting them and uh, making sure that the music is heard so that it just kind of feels good to have a team of people at your back and the whole idea of this project as you say i think the most distinct way to put it is it's for performers and listeners to cultivate a concentration and to quiet the voices inside the collective heads. Is that kind of a good way of putting it? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of doing a lot of things at once. I mean, hopefully it's music that someone enjoys playing. Hopefully it's music that somebody enjoys listening to. Um, but this whole thing about perpetual emotion, I'm kind of fascinated about it because I'm somebody who oftentimes has anxiety as a performer, and I feel like I don't always perform up to my capabilities. And so this perpetual emotion can kind of is encourages you to uh, to find a meditative space because as soon as you know you have that alarm bell go off and it disrupts something, if you're playing a perpetual motion piece, you're gonna know and you're gonna have to learn how to really self correct and self regulate. So that's kind of the the story behind why I I went with that perpetual motion texture. The book in in concert with the body of speed. Why was why was it both and not just one or the other? The idea of the book is that anybody can play these. So they're playable by a classical pianist, they're playable by a jazz pianist, there's kind of optional improvisation uh, sections, which if you're an improviser you can use or not. And the idea of the CD is that um, hopefully, you know, people will just find it enjoyable music. And then of course, you know, for people who are maybe picking up the book and interested in playing it, uh, they'll have an idea um, how they might form the pieces, how they might shape them, how they might sound with improvisation, um, so that there's a reference to them as well. I really dig the artwork, too, on it. How did that all come about? Yeah, I have a really great artist uh, who actually lives in Paris now. Her name is Jen Boyd. Um, and we went through a few iterations, but I love it. It's kind of got this feeling of like a top, topsy-turvy slide going down. Um, but it's got this circular thing that, of course, feels like perpetual motion. So I think she did a really great job. Um, and it has this, uh, yeah, the color scheme, I don't know, it just feels exciting. It feels like spring. Um, I, I like it. it. It catches the eye. Yeah, I, that's what I was thinking, too, especially before all of this kind of stuff started happening. Spring mm-hmm. was getting to be more. In fact, here in Kansas City now, we're ready to enter into kind of a cold, possibly snowy day tomorrow after we've had really good weather and the pre-travel ban kind of thing. It was like, oh, wow. Everybody playing baseball, all this stuff. <laughs> it was like, it was just, yeah, it took a left turn, huh? <laughs> Man alive, than it ever. So, um, so now that the project is out, the the Kickstarter campaign came to fruition. What's been the response? What's really exciting is that people are starting to actually play the pieces. Um, and I'm doing kind of interesting programs. Actually, um, I did this at University of Kansas and University of uh, Central Missouri where um, I work with their classical pianist, and we perform a two-piano concert where they're just giving um, each classical pianist one etude, and they play the kind of through-composed, written-out portion of the etude, and then they pass it over to me for the improvisation. So it's a pretty cool thing where they can be on stage with not only the composer, 
but they can be collaborating with somebody who improvises, which is something that not a lot of classical musicians necessarily get to do. So um, I got to do that um, in the fall at uh, those two schools, and I'm going to be bringing it to a handful of uh, universities, assuming that, uh, <laughs> that you know, that's a thing that's going to happen in the future. <laughs> Can't make any presumptions at this point. Yeah, it's it's fun to see which pieces people select. Different people are attracted to different pieces. For example, there's kind of a very Rachmaninoffy a piece, that's the last one in the collection called Enchanted Forest. And I've noticed that a lot of very traditional classical pianists are attracted to that one. And then there's kind of a more, almost kind of samba-esque Brazilian piece called Piccadilly Circus, which is very virtuosic and fast and percussive and fun and and, you know, a lot of people who are already kind of attracted to jazz or more popular style have been attracted to that one. So um, it's just been fun um, you know, having other people playing my music. That's not a thing that get, that I've gotten to experience a lot in the past. And every time I hear somebody else play it, they do it a little bit differently, and I kind of realize more possibilities. Um, and that's just very rewarding. And I would think, too, with a project like this that's opened other possibilities, the completion of this is just going to open up a whole other set of possibilities you probably haven't even thought of at this point. Yeah, I think there's a lot of changes for collaboration. I think there's a lot of uh, opportunities to uh, do these as kind of different instrumentations. I'm actually working on a couple uh, forehand versions of some of these solo piano etudes. So, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's It's a very open-ended project that's uh, kind of meant to bring other people's creativity in rather than to say, well, this is my set of music and it's just me. So, uh, yeah, I think it's exciting. Hey, man, again, thank you for reaching out. Thank you for sending the music and the book. I've really enjoyed it, and thanks for taking some time out today. I appreciate it. Yeah, hey, my pleasure. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Los Angeles, Kansas City, New York City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Jeremy for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.